The Boxer Rebellion was the fourth and largest war Imperial China fought against Western powers during the 19th century. Oddly enough, in its early stages, the Boxer movement was pitted against both Western influences in China and the Manchu-led Qing dynasty. The Qing Empress Dowager Cixi, however, saw the possibility to use these rebels for her own ends and managed to court its leaders in order to forge an anti-Western alliance. It turned out to be a bit of a misjudgment on her side, to put it mildly. The Boxer Rebellion served as a testament to the instability and chaos that pestered China and it definitely was one of the most interesting and tense episodes of Chinese history. Hey, welcome to House of History. This video is part of Project Revolution, a collaboration with other history-oriented YouTube channels. Once you've watched this video and want to know what transpired after the Boxer Rebellion, I'd suggest you check out Emperor Tiger Star's fantastic video about the Qinghai Revolution. For the Mexican Revolution at the beginning of the 19th century, check out M. Laser's great video. By the time the Boxer Rebellion set China ablaze, the reigning Qin dynasty and Chinese people had suffered major hardships and defeats for decades. Around the 18th century, it was one of the most prosperous empires of the entire world. According to Agnes Madison's statistical estimates, China had the biggest share in the world's GDP, making it the largest economy in the world during the 18th century. But then, two opium wars between China and the British Empire ended in severe, humiliating Chinese defeats. Combined with the deadliest civil war ever seen, the Taiping Rebellion, together with several other massive rebellions, China's GDP plummeted. Treaties were signed, sovereignty was conceded, and Western powers gained a foothold in the country. Following the Opium Wars, the Chinese tried to reform and embark on a self-strengthening policy. The Sino-Japanese War, three decades later, led to the near-total annihilation of China's fleet, complete defeat of its army, and subsequent humiliating peace treaty. It was the dark conclusion of China's failed reforms. A domestic crisis followed. Protests swept over the country. Something had to be done. Disasters were not only accredited to the Qing, but to foreigners as well. Two German Catholic missionaries were murdered in the Shandong province under Governor Li Binghang in 1898. This was used as a pretext to occupy multiple port cities and mining and railway rights by the Germans at first only for the British, French and Russians to quickly seize what they could get. Never waste a good crisis, right? Some Chinese, rightly so, feared their country was about to be carved up like a melon. It was in 1898 the Chinese Guangxu Emperor embarked on a radical reform program known as the 100 Days of Reform. These radical institutional reforms were unprecedented and would change China for good, if successful. Arch conservatives within the government noticed this as well and weren't too happy. The Empress Dowager Zixi managed to sway several conservative Manchu princes to support her and get rid of the Emperor. After barely 100 days of reform, palace guards and eunuchs entered the emperor's palace, seized the documents pertaining to reform, and Zixi announced the emperor had suspiciously fallen ill. It was only right for her to assume leadership, she reasoned. How convenient. And Zixi? She would be the central figure during the Boxer Rebellion. Now that we know the background of the Boxer Rebellion, I don't think it's too difficult to grasp exactly why this anti-Western rebellion occurred. In 1898, one spark was enough to ignite a full-scale rebellion in northern China. The Ji He Xuan, crudely translated to Fists of Harmony and Justice, more commonly known as Boxers, were that spark. They were a secret society loosely affiliated with the White Lotus Society and Big Sword Society, embodying anti-foreign and anti-Christian sentiment. Located in northwestern Shandong, without real clear leadership, Boxer militias were composed mainly of peasants, they took to the streets and their slogan, remove the Qing, destroy the foreigners, immediately caught the attention of many disgruntled Chinese peasants. Their anti-dynastic sentiment was due to their conviction that the Qing dynasty had lost their mandate of heaven. Their interesting name, the Boxers, was based on their special way of boxing that was akin to a rhythmic-like exercise in an attempt to harmonize both spirit and muscle in preparation for combat. What followed was a ritual-like formula, a chant breathing through clenched teeth and frothing. The boxers would claim they were possessed by spirits and were invulnerable to sabers and foreign bullets. Well, when demonstrations of this feat were held, it wouldn't always go according to plan. Nevertheless, during combat they relied on their fists and sticks rather than modern weaponry. There were female boxer groups as well, most famous, the Red Lantern Shining. They 
fought alongside the boxers. As rebellion broke out, the initial targets were Chinese Christians and the occasional Western missionary. Over time, the Boxer Rebellion gained momentum and spread across Shandong, sweeping village after village, without Beijing undertaking any countermeasures. The rest of the world wasn't too invested in this obscure rebellion in China. It would not be until 1900 when this rebellion overtook the front page of Western newspapers, pushing the ongoing Boer War to the second page. The brutality of the Boxers would shock the world. Boxers slaughtered and plundered as they made their way from the countryside towards Chinese cities, among which Beijing. And over there in Beijing, the European diplomat legation was housed. These diplomats did not feel threatened for now. When the Qing finally decided to take action against the Boxers in late 1899, it wasn't a surprise the Boxers suffered some massive defeats against Qing troops. The Boxers now probably realized they could not fight two enemies at once and took a more accommodating stance towards the Qing dynasty. Their anti-dynastic rhetoric became more moderate. Empress Dowager Zixi saw the success of the Boxer Rebellion as an instrument she could use to counter the encroachment of these European powers to whom the Boxers refer to as hairy ones. Zixi issued several edicts serving to protect Boxers in early 1900. She decided to join forces with the Boxers against these hairy ones. As such, the Boxers' new battle cry would be support the Qing government and exterminate the foreigners. As for the Western diplomats residing in the capital, Beijing, not too far away from Zixi, who was now plotting to wage war against their nations, the diplomats were confident of Western superiority and were slow to recognize that the Empress Dowager, after decades of unequal treaties, suppression and encroachment, was finally prepared to let this popular movement challenge the West by force. Some Chinese governors were happy with this new alliance. The governor of Shandong, for example, a Manchu by the name of Yu Xuan, publicly encouraged the boxers to take action against Christians as they saw fit. He even helped them out, massacring all Christians he gathered in his capital under the pretense of protection. Cixi did not enjoy popular support from all civil servants. Those that served in the provinces that were suffering under the boxers' violence considered the pro-boxer stance of Cixi to be self-destructive, but that could do nothing against the boxers without unleashing an all-out civil war, and as such, boxers continued to pillage and murder. Cixi didn't mind the Christian purges and opposition to Western influence, although the cost for some provinces certainly was heavy. Alright, so during the spring of 1900, Zixi issued several more decrees that implicitly supported the Boxer movement. Foreign diplomats, slowly waking up to what was going on, protested against it and decided that they had to resort to violence if the Qing government didn't undertake any action against these thugs. Meanwhile, a squadron of 17 Western warships had anchored just outside Taku. As the Boxers were advancing towards Beijing, massacring and pillaging along the way, the diplomats requested military protection and the fleet that 455 marines disembark. Once they reached Beijing, their number was described as dangerously low. Regardless of their number, this iconic photograph was the result of these eight nations fighting together. Some diplomats were worried, but others, among which Sir Clyde MacDonald, the British ambassador, weren't necessarily worried about the boxers, more so about the possibility of an international scramble for concessions if the Qing were to collapse. They had to get their fair share after all. All the while, the boxers kept advancing onto Beijing, destroying railway lines on the way, isolating the capital. As boxers encircled the city days later, the worries about the scramble for concessions faded to the background, even for Claude MacDonald. That same afternoon, MacDonald had requested, with urgency, reinforcements from the British Admiral Sir Edward Seymour. Seymour stationed several days of travel away left with 2,000 soldiers composed of eight different nationalities. The next morning, he planned to travel the entire distance by train, repairing the railroads on the way. On the planned date of arrival, several trucks were waiting at the Beijing station to transport the reinforcements that would arrive, but none arrived. Seymour was referred to as Sinomore from then on. Wasn't really his fault, though. As soon as Seymour left, his force was attacked by a mixture of boxers and Qing troops. Later that day, in Beijing, Sugiyama Akira, the chancellor of the Japanese legation, went to the railway station, unaccompanied, wearing a bowler hat and a western suit. He seemed like the perfect target for boxers and loyalist Qing troops. He was apprehended by Kansu braves, Muslims loyal to the Qing, 
hacked into pieces and beheaded, his mutilated corpse left on the street. Meanwhile, Seymour abandoned the expedition. There were several skirmishes between boxers and westerners throughout the province, and Dagu forts were seized by western troops to provide cover for troop landing. Within Beijing, tensions rose. The reactionary and pro-boxer Prince Duan was appointed as a Minister of Foreign Affairs. He issued an order which allowed the boxers to enter the capital, roaming the streets dressed in motley uniforms of red, black or yellow turbans and red leggings, killing Chinese Christians. Several days later, Zixi was informed, albeit falsely, that the European powers wished her to abdicate in favor of the emperor. In a rage, she ordered all diplomats to leave Beijing the next day. The next morning, German imperial envoy Baron Clemens von Kettler left the legation in order to discuss the situation with Qing representatives. He was shot and killed in the middle of the street. None of the diplomats even considered leaving the legation after this. Not leaving the city meant defying Zixi's will, however. The legations were fortified as the boxers started surrounding the area, waiting for the ultimatum to expire. This was one of the most tense moments for the Europeans, locked in their legation quarter. The foreign legations would number around 60 men, given normal circumstances. During the siege, there were 475 foreign civilians, 450 marines and 3,000 Chinese Christians that were granted asylum at the last minute. The legation under siege was divided in various ethnic squadrons under the command of MacDonald. The presence of 150 ponies ensured fresh meat. The real problem was the lack of ammunition, though. The Japanese didn't have more than 100 bullets per man, and the best equipped defenders didn't have more than 300. As Sushi's ultimatum expired, the boxers opened fire. The siege of the legation had begun. The next day, on the 21st of June, the Qing imperial government officially declared war on the European powers after receiving news about the Dagu fortresses. Boxers, now a loyal militia, took the opportunity to launch a series of attacks on mission compounds around Jiangxi, Hebei and Henan. A little bit further down the road, the Roman Catholic Cathedral was in even more trouble. Bishop Favier and his 3,000 followers, among which 800 converted Chinese schoolgirls, were protected merely by 43 French and Italian Marines. Boxers started setting fire to the surrounding buildings. The famous National Academy, with her irreplaceable library, was torched. A while back, the Chinese government had bought new Krupp guns, ideal for situations such as this one. Though General Rong Lu refused to use them, instead he ordered his troops to fire empty shells. Rong Lu wasn't the only Qing official refusing official orders from court, however. Zixi didn't have much support from other Chinese governors, and many provinces refused to send troops towards Beijing, declaring themselves neutral. China's political system of a relatively decentralized government had proven of some practical use, Fairbank and Reisha are right. I'll give you an example. Liu Zhang, together with the Canton Governor General and Imperial Commissioner Liu Kuni, ignored Su Xi's declaration of war, and as such, China, except for the northern provinces, remained neutral. The convenient fiction was accepted, and the Boxer outbreak was a rebellion instead of a war supported by the Qing dynasty. After a month of siege, the casualties in the legation were heavy, and the amount of Boxers and Qing forces were even heavier. It was a dire situation, but on the 17th of July, much to the surprise of the legation, the Chinese declared an armistice. Thing is, communication was obviously rather slow. As a wink to contemporary times, what happened in the newspapers all over the world can be considered a historic example of fake news. The Daily Mail published an article stating the legation had fallen and all those inside had been slaughtered. The Times published the obituary of MacDonald. Around the 23rd of July, a memorial was organized in the United Kingdom in order to commemorate the fallen legation. The memorial was promptly cancelled, however, once news reached Europe that the legation hadn't fallen at all. The article in the Daily Mail did have its consequences, however. The German Emperor Kaiser Wilhelm II told his fleet that was preparing to sail towards China, no mercy, no prisoners, kill all those you can capture and make them remember the German name. Eventually, the German soldiers made sure many would remember their name indeed. Nearby Tianjin, a new international military force was congregating under Lieutenant General Alfred Gasly. The fact a foreign force numbering in the thousands was gathering probably played a role in the Qing's decision to proclaim an armistice. Tianjin was swiftly captured, but instead of immediately advancing towards Beijing, the commanders decided to wait until they gathered over 20,000 troops. The military force wouldn't leave Tianjin for three more weeks. 
Meanwhile, the situation around the legation turned sour again. Li Binghang, the anti-foreign governor, arrived in Beijing at the end of July. The armistice was broken and the legation was once again under siege. Two weeks later, the relief force finally arrived at the gate of Beijing. Gathering around the city walls, it was agreed the European divisions would assault the city at dawn. Though international rivalry probably inspired the decision by the Russians to attack that night on their own, suffering heavy casualties. Not the most tactical decision, but they did breach the walls nevertheless. That morning, others followed, and it was the Brits that managed to reach the legation first. Shortly thereafter, the Japanese rescued the cathedral. Boxer resistance crumbled, and key Qin commanders took their own life. The Europeans immediately started looting the city. The Germans, arriving late, were exceptionally zealous and torched the villages surrounding the city. They certainly followed Kaiser Wilhelm's orders. Mass executions took place, with hundreds of boxers beheaded on the streets. As the European troops entered Beijing, Su Xi and the Qing imperial court fled the city, traveling on farmers' carts. The Guangxu emperor, too, was evacuated, but in a last act of spite, Su Xi refused to allow his favorite concubine to travel with him. A concubine's life would end at the bottom of a well in the Forbidden City. Now, the boxers were defeated, and over 45,000 soldiers of foreign powers were standing in northern China. Zhu Xi and the Qing imperial court had fled towards the remote Xi'an. Peace negotiations from the Chinese side were conducted by Liang Zhang, and international rivalry between the European powers meant they couldn't gain too much and punish China too harshly. Installing a regime such as in British India would have caused more chaos, and as such, the European powers demanded that pro-boxer civil servants were punished in large indemnities had to be paid. The Qing dynasty, however, the Chinese empire, and their own privileged positions were maintained. Empress Dowager Zixi could stay on as the regent. On the 17th of September, the Boxer Protocol was signed. In it, the death penalty was demanded for high-ranking civil servants, such as Yu Xuan and many more boxers. In 45 cities, exams were cancelled for five years, which meant the high posts in the civil servant apparatus could not be attained anymore. All import of arms into China was prohibited for two years and Western troops should be allowed to permanently reside within China. $333 million had to be paid as indemnity, spread over a period of 39 years with interest, which meant the total amount paid would be more than double. The amount was staggering, for it was nearly four times the total annual Qing income. The UK and US thought it so severe they offered to return some of the money as educational funds for Chinese students studying abroad. The siege of Beijing lasted for 55 days. 55 foreigners were murdered, whereas during the entire rebellion, over 200 missionaries, 2,000 foreign soldiers, and over 30,000 Chinese Christians were murdered. The official death toll among the Qing troops and boxers has never been released, though it must have numbered in the thousands, if not tens of thousands. And that's how China entered the 20th century a defeated nation that once again had to give up land, wealth and lives for the sake of European powers. As Zhu Xi could stay on as regent, the next decade would be marked by an ambitious reform program by the Qing. It was too little, too late, however. Consider checking out the playlist on the Project Revolution collaboration on the screen to see the incredible work of many other history YouTube channels. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.